Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about a deep lens, and later I'll be talking about DevOps. So a quick thing about me, I uh, went to Berkeley, I did some cog sci. Uh, AI is not my primary focus, it's just a hobby of mine, but I did study it in college. And today I'm going to be talking about the uh, part of AI regarding perception. Uh, how do we see in here, things like that. that and that's what the deep lens is mostly tied to. So last year at reInvent, they uh, gave out deep lenses to a few people who showed up. Uh, I got lucky and got one of them. Uh, when I got home, I was like, what am I gonna do with this thing? And I realized that I was using my Nest as a way to identify people coming to my door. But the problem with my Nest is it would tell me when the grass was shaking, uh, when a cat would walk by at night, uh, when a car would drive by, a uh, truck would drive by, the UPS guy would drive by, uh, but it wouldn't tell me, and it would also tell me when I walked outside in the morning. But it wasn't very specific, other things that it would identify. So I had this deep lens, which is, how many of you have a deep lens, or are at least familiar with what it is? Okay, so real quick, the deep lens is basically a thing that Amazon makes. Uh, it is a computer attached to a camera, and the computer is optimized for doing AI workloads. It has a GPU in it, uh, and they already have green grass installed on the device for you, so you can deploy lambdas to it. Uh, and it has all those other tech specs, and it's, you know, it's a pretty sweet device uh, for only $250. So the first thing you have to do when you get it is set it up. It's really more of a developer tool. It's not for consumers yet. Uh, you have to deal with things like IAM permissions, Actually, they at least take care of this for you now, but uh, back in the day, you had to do that. You had to make sure to get stuff like the exact role names correct, or the thing just wouldn't work at all. Uh, so it's definitely been improving in, that, in the year, but it's definitely still a developer device. Uh, you really need to know about Amazon, and IAM, and Lambda, and probably some Unix as well, if you really want to use it effectively. Uh, another tip, if you do get one, is to make sure to download that certificate when they present it to you, uh, because it's your only chance, and you won't be able to use the thing without it. Uh, so when you're doing the web registration, you want to download the certificate. Uh, but once you've got it set up, uh, this is what it looks like. The device summary, uh, it tells you you've got your certificate, which Wi-Fi you're on, uh, set up a basic password. Uh, and one of the nice things about that deep lens is that it, under the hood, is just an Ubuntu box. Uh, so you can do everything that you can do with Ubuntu, you can do with the deep lens, uh, including completely screw it up. So the first deep lens time I had it, I booted it into root mode because I had set up a password but then forgot to save it uh, and managed to break the whole thing, had to reinstall it. So, you know, uh, uh, warning, you, they give you plenty of rope to hang yourself with. So, uh, once you've got the deep lens set up, uh, you have to start deploying projects to it. And uh, I don't unfortunately have the time to walk through every step of project setup and deployment, but it has some pretty good documentation. They have some built-in projects. You can see two of them here, uh, object detection, face detection. Uh, and so with those uh, projects, they've already trained the models, so you don't have to train it. Uh, it's just already trained to do those things. Uh, and so, I thought to myself, you know what? I want to identify people coming to my house, so I will use face detection. That seems like the right project to use. Uh, so I set up face detection, I deployed it out to the deep lens, uh, and here's an example of it right after I got it. So this is me walking up to my house, and you can see that it's done absolutely nothing whatsoever because it could not see my face. Uh, if it's, and as you see here in a second, uh, I had to walk all the way across the grass uh, up to the window where the deep lens was just to get it to see my face. So there it finally detected a face. I basically had to look right into the front window of the house before it would detect my face. So face detection wasn't the best project to be using for that. Uh, I then decided to use object detection instead. Uh, so the object detection again is a trained model and it's trained to detect a bunch of different objects uh, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, and it's, it's pretty cool. It, uh, you, once you've set it up, this is deploying the project, so you select it. Uh, it tells you this is the lambda I'm gonna use and this is what I'm gonna do, and it creates the lambda for you and all of that, and then it deploys that lambda to the device using green grass. 
This is uh, what it looks like after you've deployed. So you can see up at the top there where it's uh, telling you how far along the deployment is. Uh, and here's some information about the device, such as the, uh, the name and things like that. Uh, this is the current project. So since this is the first deployment, nothing is there. But if you go and look at this after deployment, you'll see what's currently deployed to it. Uh, some interesting things about the project. So they, they have ways for you to view the stuff. For example, they have this. They have the view, the output. Uh, but if you click on that, you have to get a certificate and install it on your web browser and on the device, and it's super complicated. Uh, and if you know a tiny bit of Unix, then this is way easier. Uh, so my deep lens, the first thing I did after I set it up uh, was create a uh, login for myself. I dropped my SSH key onto the device, just like you do with any other Unix thing, so that I could then SSH into it and cat out the files. Uh, so these would be the commands that you would use to stream the raw video image or stream the uh, project output. And I'll show you a little bit in a second. Uh, one thing to note, though, is you probably want to make sure you're on the same network. Uh, it's a pretty heavy, heavy load of streaming, so you probably don't want to do it remotely, although I have. It's actually worked. Uh, one thing that I found on my Mac is that you have to add this caching command uh, or it will just fail. So these commands aren't exact. Uh, it will depend very much on your version of mPlayer and if you're on a Mac or a Linux box or I don't even know if it works on a Windows box. It might. I haven't even tried it. Uh, if you can figure out some way to stream things to Windows. But anyway, that's the view, this output box. So you could do it through the web console if you want, but I found that to be way more complicated than just SSHing in. Uh, and then the last section here tells you things about the IP address and, uh, you know, so that you can SSH to it and you can actually find it. Uh, so how do I do development? The way they want you to deploy code to a deep lens is to use the Lambda editor uh, and edit it on Lambda and then run through the deployment process again, redeploy your project. That's great. Uh, and in a best case scenario, that takes like 10 minutes to deploy a change. But since it's a Unix box, I just log in, change to that directory, which then has the ARN of your function. Uh, you can edit the code right there on the deep lens. So that's what I do. I just edit it, restart the green grass service, which gets it to pick up the change. Uh, and then you can go and view the logs right in that directory. So the way that I do my deep lens development is I log into the box, I log into the deep lens, I edit right on the deep lens. Once it's working in a way that I like, or if I have to take a break or something, I push it up into GitHub. Uh, and so then I have it saved. And then eventually, once I get to a place where I really like it, I'll take the code I wrote, put it back into Lambda, and then redeploy the project just to make sure it still works. But this is a much more rapid way to develop on a deep lens. So let's see how object detection works. Ah, look at that. It can detect an object without having to walk up right to the window. So it's definitely detecting a person there. And you can see, and I'll still walk up to the window just for uh, example's sake, but you can see that it's detecting me the whole time. And it's a little hard to read there, but the probabilities are pretty high. During the day, it's constantly detecting objects. So whenever my car is in the driveway, it's constantly detecting the car. Uh, it likes to think that my neighbor's house is a train. And it tells me that all the time. So here's an example of it going. So this is the, what the video, this is what the processed image looks like. Uh, so there's my daughter with the nanny walking outside. Uh, and so you can see that it's constantly changing. It's constantly drawing boxes around what it's identified. And it's a little hard to read, but it shows you the what object it is uh, and what percent probability it is that object. Uh, and so you can see that it's doing, you know, it's jumping around, uh, it's, but it's doing a pretty good job of at least finding most of the objects. They're now too far away to be detected as people. So this is one frame from that video. And you can see here that it's detected my daughter and she is a person. Uh, it has detected my nanny who is a horse. And of course, the train across the street. And so if you go on to the logs, uh, you can see this in the, the logs on the device. So on the device, it will give you the stream of everything that it's detected. Uh, by default, with their default code, it only logs what it found in the probabilities. Uh, but you can easily add in to the XY coordinates. 
Uh, and you can see here that it, it detected a person and it did a really good job. It had a high probability, 79, 89%, but then you can see all that other stuff. Uh, you can also get this from the console. Uh, so it gives you a, uh, a string, basically, which I've uh, blacked out for security reasons. Uh, but if you go to, it, it click the link over to the IoT console, uh, you can see all of those same messages running through the IoT console. Uh, so you put in that string, you hit go, uh, and it pushes it through. So uh, let's take a look at the code that we're using to do this. Uh, the first thing that you'll notice there is uh, we've got these, uh, the input width and height, so those are specified based on the model. So by default, their model is trained on a small image. Uh, so you end up having to scale the image, but you have to tell it that. Uh, that first thing at the top is the model path. So that's where the actual model lives that has been pre-built for you. Uh, and all of this is already provided in the code. Uh, the next thing you see is these are the different types of objects that it can detect. So those are the 20 things that it can detect. Airplanes, bicycles, birds, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then this is the actual loop that runs. So this is the inference loop. Uh, and uh, this uses, uh, runs through each frame, so it uses OpenCV to get the frame, uh, and then it does stuff with the frame. So the first thing it does is resize it to match the size of the model. Uh, and so if you're training your own models, you can train it on larger sizes. <clears throat> but by default, you need to use the smaller size. Uh, and then it goes and it actually runs the inference and it says, you know, did I find an object? If I found the object, this is where it actually says, where is that object, X and Y coordinates? Then this is where it uploads to S3. So I added this myself. Uh, this doesn't come by default. Uh, and so what this does is it actually takes a crop of just what was in that blue rectangle uh, and it uploads that to S3. And you'll see in a minute why I do that. Uh, and then this is where it actually draws the rectangle onto the, onto the image that it's displaying out. Uh, and you'll notice before, like I said, you'll get this streaming log of every single thing it detects. And that can be really noisy, especially when it's detecting stationary objects. So what I've actually done in my code is commented out the part where it pushes those messages up back to Amazon, because uh, it was costing me about $20 a month just for those messages to be received uh, on the IoT side because it was generating like 300 million messages or something. Uh, so I turned that off, but <clears throat> the, the, you'll, I'll tell you later about some workarounds that I'm planning on doing. So uh, this is what the push to S3 code actually looks like. You just, so you can see here where I'm skipping cars and potted plants because it was detecting those a lot, so I'm not even pushing those up. Uh, what I hope to do in the future is actually do essentially an ignore box so make it say, uh, if you've detected a car in this spot, don't tell me about it again until it moves away. So basically keep track of stationary objects. So it'll only detect the car when it first parks in the driveway and then not do it again. Uh, and then I won't have to do these, these hacks of not uploading it anymore. Uh, also, I could potentially put the logging back as well because then it wouldn't be logging all the time. Uh, so you get Bodo to import. Uh, I grab the bucket name from the OS environment, which you can set in your Lambda. And then I put a timestamp on it, and I encode it up and push it up to S3. Very simple, but it took a while to get this code working, so uh, it's all on my GitHub, and I'll have the link at the end, but uh, that's why I show it to you. And then lastly, I push a, an, uh, a message to the IoT pipeline that says this is what I detected and whether the upload succeeded or failed. So we're back to these images, uh, and this is what I get in my S3. So it'll tell me that I found a person, and it'll show that image, a horse with that image, a train with that image. Some other good images I've gotten are a TV monitor, which is the side of my garage, uh, the house across the street when the wind blows the branches of my tree detects as a person. I have no idea why that looks like a person, like maybe there's eyes or something. Uh, me walking, that was a chair. It likes to, likes to find chairs. It's, it's really intent on chairs. I was a horse, apparently, at 1.2. I don't know why. I, maybe because of the way I was walking. I don't know. <laughs> and for some reason, this pinwheel that my daughter has out on the lawn, it detects as a boat constantly. So I get 
essentially what looks like this. This is what my S3 looks like. Uh, it's timestamps uh, and then the label uh, and then that number is essentially just a tick number. It's just to make sure that it's unique. Uh, but this is basically what that looks like. So you can see I'm getting person, person, person a lot, but also down at the bottom there you see TV monitor, TV monitor, TV monitor, and so on and so forth. So that's why I really need to get in there and do the ignore box. So that, that is the next thing I'm gonna do so that it stops uploading pictures of the side of my garage. So what do I do once I have all of these things on, uh, up, uploaded to S3? Uh, I use Amazon's AI services to help me make it better. So these are all the different Amazon AI services. Actually, that's not even all of them. Uh, but I, in, in particular, am using Amazon Recognition. So uh, how many of you are familiar with Amazon Recognition? Used it before? Okay, so you've heard about it. Uh, so Amazon Recognition is an image processing tool that Amazon has. Uh, it does a bunch of stuff. Uh, for example, it can identify different parts of an image. Uh, it can uh, determine if an image is safe for work. Uh, so you can give it an image and it can say, yes, this is safe. Uh, it can identify a whole bunch of stuff about faces and people. So you give it an image and it can tell you that their eyes are open or closed or what predicted gender, if they're happy, things like that. Uh, you can do similarity matching. So is this face the same as this face? Uh, it can even identify celebrities. So if a celebrity ever came to my door, it could automatically tell me that they had arrived if it knew about them. Hasn't happened yet so far. <clears throat> but it's really easy to use Amazon recognition. Basically, all you do uh, is create a trigger on your S3 bucket. So every time my deep lens uploads an image to S3, uh, it triggers a lambda to run. And, oh, goody. <laughs> your images are gone. I'm just gonna, there we go. <laughs> uh, so it triggers a lambda uh, to run every time an image is uploaded. And the functionality that we're using, that I'm using, is the uh, face matching. So you can give it a set of, you can train it on a group of faces, uh, and then you can ask it, is the face that you're looking at now in the group that I've trained it on? Uh, so what I've done is I've taken all the images that is captured of actual people that come to my door, and I've trained it to say, you know, this is me, this is my wife, this is my daughter, this is the Steve the Postman, this is the UPS guy, uh, and I've trained it on all of those. So now, when an image comes into S3, uh, it, it uh, goes to Amazon Recognition, uh, and Recognition says, I think this is who it is, uh, and it sends an email. So that's where I'm at with the project right now. Uh, some of the next steps, uh, the big next step, well, the first big next step is the ignore box to get cut down significantly on the noise. So right now, this costs me probably uh, $20, $25 a month because of all of the images that are getting uploaded to S3. So once I implement the ignore box, I'll probably get it down to, you know, 50 cents a month or something because there'll be far fewer images going up to Amazon. Uh, the ignore box is the first step. The next step is to push the model training back to the camera. So one of the great things about the deep lens is that you can train your own models and you can use Amazon's other tools like their MXNet or whatever to train your model. So what I plan to do is take all of those images that I've now collected and labeled and say, train, a, train a new model that just detects the people that I'm interested in and it just detects people. <clears throat> so I train a people model so it can look for unknown people and it can look for uh, known people. And then once that's running on the deep lens, it won't even have to upload images anymore because if it has a high confidence that it's detected me, for example, all it has to do is upload a message to Amazon that says, I detected Jeremy. Or maybe not even do that. But I don't have to actually upload the image and process it. And that's the beauty of the deep cam, is that it can be done right on the, on the device. Uh, and then I'm, I'm gonna make an iPhone app, basically, that sends me a push notification that says, you know, I, Jeremy came to the door, or an unknown person came to the door, and actually send the picture to my phone, so that I can look at the picture and, and see who it is, who's at my door. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, the last step is to actually make it so that when I get that picture on my phone, I can type in, oh, that's so-and-so, and actually retrain the model to, in the future, recognize that person 
uh, by uploading it back to recognition and training it. So that's, that's all stuff that I'm working on right now, uh, but I'm not quite done with that yet. Uh, and then, oops, sorry, that slid in there. Uh, and so the code that I'm working on, I keep on my GitHub. So that's where you can find, right now, the only thing I have there is the, uh, the green grass code that I showed you, the, the, the actual like image processing from the camera, uh, as well as a few shell scripts that I use to start streaming to the device, uh, and, and all of those directories and stuff like that. So uh, I have time for a couple of questions. If you guys have any questions uh, about what I've done or anything like that, Nothing? No, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, so the way the, yeah, so that's interesting. It, it runs OpenCV, but the way, oh, sorry, repeat the question. Uh, it was more of a statement about OpenCV having the ability to detect moving objects. Uh, yes, uh, the way the deep lens works right now, at least that code that they provide you by default, it does individual frames of the image. So, it, um, you can, but it's not how it works by default. So you'd have to like code it yourself. It can be, totally be done, but you'd have to do it yourself. But yes, that is a good idea. Uh, and in fact, I would like it to at least identify cars, unique cars, so I can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. The suggestion instead of uploading the image to the car, you could do a time time application, perhaps ask the user to send the image to the car. Send the image to the car. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, is there a speaker? And the answer is yes, it has a speaker. And you can use the speaker. Um, uh, for my purposes, it wouldn't be all that helpful because the, the camera itself is in the front window in the bedroom that's in the front. So I wouldn't really be near it most of the time to hear it announce. What I really, really would love is for them to make a way for me to send push notifications to Alexa devices. If anyone from Amazon is here is listening, please, that would be wonderful. Uh, because then I could have it send it to my Alexa devices, which are all around the house. Uh, and then your suggestion about hashing the image is an interesting one, but the downside to it is none of the images are identical. So it's, right, it, it, the way it's detecting, you'd have to, to grab the vectors that it detects of the person or the face and hash that. Uh, and that's effectively what, you're, what I would be doing if I push the model down to the camera, is then the camera would be doing the detection and only sending back, I found this person instead of the actual image. Yeah. Did I see another question? No? Okay. Well, then thank you guys and. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much.